Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 o'clock. Welcome to this week's program. Uh, today we're doing good bugs versus bad bugs. And our speaker is Master Gardener Leslie Paulson. And uh, as you have questions, please put those in the chat box and we'll get to those at the end. Leslie, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Okay, this morning we are going to talk about insects, and I'm sure that many of you enjoy them as much as I do. I'm hoping I can make you more aware of which are the good and the bad. So how do you tell which one is good and which one's bad? So yeah, here you see a cicada eating a bug. Is it eating a good bug or a bad bug? Do they only eat good bugs? No, they eat both, unfortunately. It just isn't simple. At the bottom here, I put what a praying mantis exact looks like. I know yesterday we were at the teaching garden and we, had, we found two of them, but I will tell you more about those later. So we have three groups of beneficial insects, the predators that eat other insects, the parasitoids. These are insects that lay their eggs in or on other insects. And of course, this eventually kills them. And then we have our pollinators. Over 400 different species of bees are in Virginia. And then 90% of bugs are harmless or beneficial. And the 1% gets a bad reputation. So it's sort of like we, when we talk about right plant, right place, well, it can be a question of the right bug in the right place as well. You must identify the good and the bad in order to gauge how the war in your yard's going. I mean, some springs are horrible and others, the Japanese beetles don't show up so much. So who's the good guy in your yard? So these are the top five. We have assassin bug, hover or seraphid fly, lacewing. Then we have the ladybug, ladybird species. And then we have the parasitic wasp and the aphidious wasp. I really think these guys are sort of cute looking, the assassin bugs. Um, there was one year that out on my deck, I found it's like the baby, the eggs had just hatched. And there were a slew of them. They were pretty small. So I picked them up, but they, they can bite you. But this bug, all of its body parts are there to get food because they pierce, suck, and chew. There used to be an agent, I think he was, I don't know, it was Fauquier or Winchester, that his license plate said something about this. So what's on their menu? A lot of things we don't want in our yard, the aphids, cabbage worms, potato and cucumber beetles, cutworms, all the ones you see here, the four-line plant bugs, we have those at the teaching garden during a certain time of the, in the spring. And Japanese beetles are ones that anyone who has plants in the rose family has problem with. And then we also talk about the tomato, excuse me, tomato hornworms and the many different caterpillars we have. Here is the hover fly or seraphid fly. They look like a small wasp, but they're harmless. And they hover like a hummingbird, which is sort of neat. And so I, when you read more about them, then you'll, you'll get that ah moment when you're in the garden. So the adults pollinate and the larvae consume. They eat tons of aphids and again, cabbage worms and other things that you don't want, such as mealybugs. And these are why we do not want to use insecticides in the garden because we easily can leave residues behind that get the good bugs instead of the bad bugs. Here it shows you this, I didn't write the pronunciation down for this one, cacnid fly, which looks an awful like, like a regular fly. And then we have the wasp's larva there feeding on the grubs. It's interesting to see the pictures of what they consume and how they do it. 
Now this guy, the lace wing, he gets a, a bad rap and it's because when they hear lace wing, people are thinking of the lace bug instead. We'll talk about him in the next part here. They're attracted to lights. I often see these on my deck on late on a summer evening because they're attracted to the light inside of the house. But they eat the honeydew that pests produce. You'll see this on a lot of leaves at the right time of the year where you get that sticky stuff. And the aphids are usually hanging around there. But they eat asparagus, beetle larvae, caterpillar eggs, and the lace bugs. And scale. Oh, there's so many different kinds of scale out there. Spider mites and white flies. Aren't they crazy looking? The larvae anyway. The lace wings are sort of pretty. And doesn't this picture on the left, my left, maybe not yours, it, it reminds me of the um, flower Solomon seal with the filament with the egg on the end. And look at the face on this little guy. He's so cute. And then the thing as children we grow up thinking is a good bug are the ladybugs or the ladybird beetle. There's over 450 different kinds of these in North America. And again, you can see the larva sort of looks like miniature alligators and look how much they can eat. Over 5,000 in a lifetime. And again, they eat all the larva of these beetles in, in our yard and spider mites and whatever that we don't want because for vegetables, they damage the vegetable, which makes it maybe not always inedible, but it sure doesn't look good afterwards. And here we'll sh I show you the life cycle of a ladybug, 48 weeks from pupa to adult, which is amazing in itself, and how much they change and what they look like so that you can watch for them. Because the larva stage, I think, is a lot of times when people tend to kill it because they're, oh, what's that? So you got to know what they're looking like so that you don't kill them. And here's the aphidias. He's a very bu busy bug, especially for his size. I mean, he's only an eighth of an inch long, maybe, and he's sort of dark in color. And when they lay an egg, it's a single egg in the aphid nymph. Do any of you do wordle? I laugh because nymph was the word the other day. It hatches and eats aphids as it matures. The larva get rid of over 40 species of aphids. And like I said, almost every tree, shrub, plant out there can have an aphid that likes it. And then we have the parasitic wasp. And this is where I was saying we would revisit the hornworm. Yeah, they're harmful and we don't like them because what they do to our tomatoes. But this is one of the primary places this wasp lays their eggs. So if you have this caterpillar with eggs attached to it on your tomato plant, I would leave it because it's not going to be alive for long. The wasp is relatively small, it doesn't sting, and there's 10 different species. But like I said, they lay the eggs inside or on top, and eventually the larvae eat the tissue and the vital organs. And they eat all those kind of bugs again that we truly know we don't like. Now here is the brachymid wasp versus the hornworm. I'm just showing you how they mature from stage one where the eggs are laid on the caterpillar by the female wasp, and then they hatch. When done feeding, the larva chew a hole in the skin of the caterpillar, and then they squeeze through. And once outside, the larva spin cocoons, and then you get the fully spun cocoon. A wasp will pupate inside and emerge as an adult. So it's a home for these animals, too. And this is what a hornworm becomes if it grows to adulthood. I like to show people that because, you know, the clear wing sphinx moth, I'm not sure exactly which this sort of looks like, is a native sphinx moth to our area. So now we come to the bad bugs, which, like I said, the top five, the four-line plant bug, Japanese beetle lace bug, scale, of course, and then there's that crazy stink bug. So the four-line plant bug spends the winter as eggs inside 
woody plant growth. And I know at our teaching garden, we find this bug every year on the Korean mums we have in the Four Seasons bed, and also the Russian sage that is in different places in the garden. I know it's in the deer bed, and it models and makes the leaves look all spotted like this. They feed for a month and lay eggs, and then they die. So that's only a period of time that we have them around, but they pierce the leaf surface and suck out juices. Doesn't that sound yummy? But they can be found on azaleas too and lavender and shasta daisy and viburnums. And assassin bugs and spiders and damsel, damsel bugs can control them. So we have the Japanese beetle, and I know a lot of people don't enjoy squishing them with their bare fingers, but there's only one, two in a plant. That's what I do. But a pail of soapy water or even a, a, a jar, which has a lid with some soapy water in, you can shake the beetles off of the plant like roses, and they land in there, and then you put the lid on and they won't get out. The parasitic wasps can help with this problem. And the beetles are only around for like four to six weeks at the beginning of the summer. Leslie, your mic just cut out there for a minute. I, I cut out? Yes. How far should I go back to the beginning of the slide? Uh, started talking about there's so many beetles and moths and then you cut out. Okay, let me plug my headset in because sometimes this helps. Hang on a second. Whoops. You I'll get it. So anyway, you feed on 250, 70, excuse me, 275 different species of plants. And they're active for four to six weeks. I'm getting there. I have too many cords on my table here. Okay, so a pail of soap and water, you can get rid of all the beetles just by shaking them into the bucket. You can use a jar or something, plastic usually, so you don't have to worry about it getting broken. But don't buy the beetle traps because they're just a lure. It's just uh, something that someone came up with to make money. And here's the really bug that is bad, lace bug. Not the lace wing, but the lace bug. They're about an eighth inch long with wings and you find them on the underside of the leaves. So if you start seeing tiny specks of poo on your leaves, you might want to give your plant a good examination. Many of these only attack one plant species. Others feed on several types of host plants. And here's some of the things that they attack. A lot of the things we have in our yard, azaleas, rhododendrons, laurel linden, but you can blast these nymphs with a stream of water. I know I often tell people the way to get rid of them is just with a strong stream of water. Because once they're off the plant, if they want to back on, they got to make their way there. And it's not quickly. And hopefully a bird will find them. But it's not a problem when the plant is located in proper growing conditions. It's not stress. And this bug won't come and attack them so much. And here's the scale. Like I said, there's so many different species of scale. Several years back, um, I went and did the Charleston Home and Garden Tour, and you're not allowed to take pictures. I tried to find this the picture, but I couldn't. It's probably on my old laptop. But I found scale on, I think it was azalea plant, and I'm not, it was almost an inch large. I had never seen one that large before, but they they're sort of interesting how they puff up almost and stand in a row on a branch. But you can wipe these scale off with a cotton ball soaked in alcohol or crush them with your fingers. One thing that really attracts them is if you're over fertilizing your plants, that's more food for them too. So, and they like smell it or realize it's there and you'll have a bigger crop of these guys. They can cause blotches or minor discoloration of leaves. The honeydew attracts wasps and ants. But again, the lace wings and ladybugs and the parasitic wasps will help you control this. And that's why they need to be protected. 
stink bugs, I really think one reason so many people like them is they like to come inside and they do smell. Again, they pierce and suck their predator. They don't bite or sting, so you're, they aren't going to hurt us. And they won't reproduce inside. When they get inside, your best bet is just to vacuum them up if you don't like trying to catch them. And you have to seal the cracks or caulk the cracks, you know, inside and out. They damage fruit skins. These often damage the, when you see sort of a slightly light orangey color on a tomato. It's usually this insect that does it. Again, you can use the soapy water pool to kill them. You can flush them down your toilet too if you want, or like I said, vacuum them up. And now these are just a few other bugs that you might see in your yard. So I'm gonna talk about them. When growing up, we heard about a doodle bug. The, a picture here of the, I would guess it's sometimes, you would call it a moth actually, or anyway, a flying bug. I found this in my yard on a, a dead crab apple tree that I had, and he's quite beautiful. But it's the one where you see him in the sand where he's digging these little traps for insects. That's what he looks like before he morphs into this. And praying mantis, we were discussing this yesterday at our teaching garden because two different people found the egg sacs. Unfortunately, most of the egg sacs, we, I would say the largest percentage of them are the Chinese praying mantis. Again, they eat good bugs. And like one of our master gardeners says, there's pictures of them actually going after a hummingbird. But they are very large, five inches, the Carolina native praying mantis is much smaller. So when you find egg sacs in a, your garden, depending on how large your garden is, you might want to consider destroying some of them because there's over 300 little guys in there. And then there are the slugs, which are just plain slimy <laughs> for another other word. But I know what I do, I find these underneath my bird baths that have a hollow bottom when they sit on the ground. And so when I'm out there cleaning them, what I do is I have gloves on usually because it's not that I mind touching them, but you get that gunk all over you. I just take them and throw them into the grass. And when I go in the house, I know the birds are going to eat them. You can use diatomaceous earth around plants that they like to consume. And the other thing is don't water during the day. Water early in the morning so the foliage dries before nightfall. That's the other thing that can attract them. Now here is a good slide for you because it shows you what you need to plant to attract the good bugs. There's a lot of similarities in different categories. A lot of the herbs are what they like. Different bugs like different herbs. You see the wasp likes the fennel and the dill and thyme. Assassin bugs doesn't have one there. Um, and then we have oregano for ladybugs. But it's this will show you some of the things that if you plant, you are going to be attracting good bugs. And it's something to consider because they keep the bad bugs population down. So remember, you got to identify your insect before you do anything. And I found in the first slide, I said 1%. On the book, one of the books I primarily use, they use both numbers and I can't quite figure out why, but 10% can be considered harmful. But if you have any problem identifying them, if you take a good picture, you can send it to the help desk. Um, you can call us and ask. Often, if, you can, if you're good at describing something, which is the technique I use when I use, I work at the help desk, because I just go to you know, your search engine and describe what I am seeing and what it's on, and you might be able to get identification. iNaturalist is a good free app. There's many of them out there, but that's the one I use the most. And some of the new bugs that we have around now that 
are very harmful are ones that are destroying our ash trees, the emerald ash borer, and then we have the Asian, excuse me, Asian longhorn beetle. And then the newest one, which Thomas is going to talk about next week, will be the spotted lantern fly, fly which likes the Atlantis tree. Here just shows you some of the stages. Like I said, he will talk more about it. I just wanted to show you what you might see. The, the, the black with white polka dots is the season we're coming up to. And then this website has Meet Your Beneficials, where it describes most of the good ones and then the natural enemies of all the bad ones. And you were sent with your Zoom link a paper where I listed all the websites and books that can help you. Here again is just a handout for spotted lanternfly. And here's the references. Like I said, The Good Bug, Bad Bug by Jeff, J Jessica Walser. That it, it's a little book, so it's easy just to take with you somewhere. And then there's a YouTube where she talks about insects. That's very good. And Dr. Michael Ropp has a bug of the week website you can go there and sign up and then also ohio state has many many free classes that they take that you can go on and watch um, i also have mary gardner's books and she talked this spring about insects it was really very informational and that, this is her here. So does, let's see, what's the questions? Any questions? Looks like we don't have any in the chat, but if anybody wants to unmic and uh, ask their questions, feel free. So does anybody, uh, this went faster than I thought it was going to today. <laughs> Depends upon how, but again, like I said, if you, um, those of you are master gardeners, any of you're not, you can come out to our teaching garden and see some of the things we have. And we can always talk about insects because usually if you have that insect in your yard, it's probably going to be at our teaching garden as well. Even the bad guys. So, oops. I'm trying to see what, um, Okay, so nobody has a question? Let's not look that way. Okay. Uh, thank you, Leslie, and thank everybody for coming. And next week, we'll be talking in more detail about the spotter and lantern fly. Oh, this um, is a question. Oh, yeah, and Wendy, uh, excuse me, Christina will send you the evaluation. Yes, please make sure you fill out the evaluation that helps us um, be responsible to both the county and the state. So All thanks right. everybody and we'll Thank see you. you next week. Have a good day. If you're interested in getting your lawn in shape this spring, why not consider our best lawns program? This involves having a master gardener come out to measure, sample, and evaluate your lawn. When the soil test results come back, you'll get a customized nutrient plan along with control recommendations as needed. If you're interested, contact Natalie Walker at nwalker at pwcgov.org. If you enjoyed this video, please contact us at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Let us know about your comments, your suggestions for other videos and classes.